Sauropods were remarkable animals. As well as being massive and towering over the landscape, these organisms incorporated some remarkable anatomy and biology to assist their massive frames. And one of the most controversial comes in the suggestion that sauropods may have possessed a proboscis or trunk. The trunked sauropod movement is usually said to have started with Walter Coombs's seminal 1975 paper, Sauropod Habits and Habitats, which notes that the size, shape and position of the bony nostrils in sauropods is similar in some respects to mammals, which have, or are thought to have had, either a proboscis or at least a large nose. While an interesting idea, and certainly an intriguing one, the idea of trunked sauropods holds up little when compared to known anatomy of both sauropods and to known organisms that do possess a proboscis. In terms of skull shape, mammals with proboscids or inferred proboscids, including tapirs, astrotheres, the stem whale Macrocetus, and cygers, have narrow snouts compared to the rest of the skull. Proboscideans do differ from the aforementioned mammals in that they have more derived, shorter snouts and hypertrophied incisor sockets that obscure the ancestral skull shape. Despite this, it is worthy to note that proboscideans with unexpanded incisor sockets, such as ambulodontids, antijuvenile and tuskless modern elephants, are typically narrow across the premaxilla, compared to the width across the cheeks. Given that a proboscis is used for selective foraging and hence has to be narrow and prehensile at the tip, it follows that it must typically be the extension of a narrow snout. Sauropods, on the other hand, have a completely different structure compared to these other tetrapods, in that their skulls are broad and sometimes remarkably so. Even diplodocoids, which are popularly imagined by those unfamiliar with the animals as having thin, delicate skulls, have robust and rectangular skulls, where the mouth is often as broad or even broader than the rest of the skull. While a few trunked animals contradict this trend, like dinotheres, there aren't many narrow-snouted sauropods, which already weighs heavily against the trunk hypothesis. Sauropod skulls also lack the facial muscles that are present in mammals, and are absent in dinosaurs and reptiles in general. In mammals, a proboscis is formed through a group of muscles that are ancestrally associated with mammals, in which the upper lip and nose have been co-opted to form a trunk. That which includes the levator labi, rectus nasi, and caninus. The absence of these muscles in reptiles means that they lack the adaptions required to evolve a trunk, with this absence found in all known lepidosaurs, crocodilians and birds, meaning it would be highly unlikely for these animals to suddenly evolve such a feature found nowhere else in their close relatives. Large and strong muscles, especially trunks, leave visible attachment sites, such as crests and scars. These features are apparent in known trunked animals like tapirs, which clearly show obvious lumps and deep concavities, all of this being associated with the attachment of such musculature. Such attachment sites are entirely absent in the skulls of sauropods, and the bony bars around the nostrils of sauropods appear to be far too weak to have supported such a large piece of musculature. Trunks are complex prehensile organs, and as such, they require sophisticated muscular control. Trunked animals like elephants have a huge facial nerve that unites with a large maxillary branch of the trigonomal nerve. If any tetrapods were to evolve a proboscis, then they would need specialised, hypertrophied nerves. Brain casts of Diplodocus and Camarasaurus showed that the facial nerve roots were tiny, 1mm and 3mm wide respectively. This demonstrates that the neurology required for a proboscis in these sauropods is absent, and that they would have been absent across the group, as other lines of evidence support. Sauropod toothwear provides a glimpse into how sauropods ate their food, and this gives some valuable insight into their appearance. Sauropod teeth are typically heavily worn, with large wear facets produced by abrasion from food. Furthermore, inclined wear facets on the outside surfaces of diplodocoid upper and lower jaw teeth show that these dinosaurs grabbed foliage in their mouths and then either pulling the head and neck sharply upwards or downwards, a style of feeding known as unilateral branch stripping. This method of feeding contradicts the hypothetical trunked sauropod, as a hypothetical animal that grabs branches in their mouths and pulls their heads up and down sharply would have the chance of damaging their proboscis, which is inconsistent with trunked animals, which grab their food and lightly move it into the mouth. The evolution of a trunk also seems redundant, given that sauropods had already evolved one of the most extreme and remarkable food-gathering organs, that being their remarkable necks. 
These remarkable necks would have provided these animals with unparalleled vertical and lateral foraging ranges. This is notable, as trunked mammals are almost all short-necked. The long necks of sauropods seem to have played an equivalent role that trunks do in mammals, and it makes little sense anatomically for both structures to be present in tandem. And finally, the trunked sauropod hypothesis mostly came about because most sauropods have dorsally located bony nostrils. When the trunk hypothesis was adopted, albeit rarely, the explanation for a trunk comes from that the high-placed nasal airway could travel all the way down the trunk so that the fleshy nostrils are at its tip. The hypothesis was rarely, if ever, taken seriously, and yet it is a prime example of the speculative nature of paleontology, and science in general, testing what is and isn't supported by evidence, and in some cases, this speculation results in interesting fringe theories like the trunked sauropods. And with that, I hope you enjoyed this video. If you would like to see more, be sure to subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll see you next time, whenever that may be.